right, Psalm 146, let's call this one, in summary, the way of the wicked, a quote that's literally going to come out of the last verse in this psalm that once again begins, praise the Lord, but does not seem to end in a bookend as after introducing this psalm with praise the Lord, he's going to introduce a contrast where he's going to say, don't so much trust in princes. Why? Because they got to die just like the rest of us. And once again, God has a power that is eternal. However, the power of princes can be deceptive because they can often offer us what is described as the carrot or the stick. Two different forms of incentive, either pain or reward, meaning the stick is for those uh, who they can beat into submission and the carrot is those who they can bribe or persuade or write the right amount of uh, money on the paycheck to persuade, to simply do whatever regardless of right or wrong, which this psalmist is going to remind us still matters as he's going to go into a description of the character of God and why he is to be trusted above princes. Why? Because the paychecks might not always be coming in in a way that would leave you in the favor of friends or family, understanding that I think it's Solomon in the Proverbs who notices that the one who is without can sometimes have a hard time finding friends or even family to pick up the phone when they call. In contrast, David notices that God's love is more consistent. As in verse five, he's going to say, blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, who made heaven and earth and going beyond the verse six description of his creation. It's going to talk about in verse seven, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Verse eight, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. As he's going to go on to conclude in verse 9, the Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. And as we entitled this verse, it's going to introduce a contrast when in that last section it says, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin, reminding me of a recurring theme, even if it is a subtle theme that we've seen before in the Psalms. Quite possibly another version of the folly we found in idolatry when this time we are willing to offer up our allegiance to anybody who can write that check. Before it was in Psalms 115 and 135, an idol that we created that we would probably assign the credit for our blessings or in which we would put hope for paying us out or giving us even more blessings downrange. However, this time in princes who can sometimes offer the carrot or the stick, they can seem a whole lot more menacing or easier to rely on than the God we can't see. And it's quite possibly for that reason that a subtle illustration running through much of the new covenant, if not both the new covenant and the old covenant, Old Testament or New Testament, depending upon your perspective, is the dog metaphor. One of the things that we have talked about in days past is even Hitler had a dog, meaning dogs will tend to respond to whoever is feeding them and meeting their immediate needs. And so God is helping us to understand the importance of developing standards that require people to appeal to us at a level beyond our immediate needs. Something that Paul also cautions us of when he literally uses that dog metaphor in the beginning of, I think it is chapter three, in the way it's a chapter in which he will go on to describe the tragedy of those whose God is their belly. And if you know very much about dogs uh, domesticated or even in their own element, in a lot of ways, their God can be their belly. Reminding me of another summary theme that came to mind in reading this psalm, understanding that God has very subtle ways of exposing our belly as our priority or a driving motive that may have actually replaced God in looking at the way that the revelation talks in sequence, but it doesn't always specify time. And so when it talks about seals being broken or trumpets being blown or bowls of judgment being poured out, it doesn't necessarily say that those things are unfolding all in an instant. And it's important to understand that because Jesus in Matthew 24 describes end times as catching people by surprise, which can be hard to reconcile with what he told to John in the Revelation, which seems to describe uh, plagues that are poured out all at once. But when we realize that the Revelation does not talk about the, once again, the timing with which those judgments uh, unfold, then we can realize that sometimes God gives 
just enough tragedy to catch our attention, but then he gives us just enough peace to find out what our, once again, true motivation actually is. And so no matter how much tragedy he brings in our lives, if we are always going back to a pattern that makes it clear that our chief motivation is whoever can provide for us the benefits of the carrot or the protection from the stick, then he is once again subtly exposing the way to which our God may still be our belly. Which is why we sometimes say, God's best to you as you go forward in him. God willing, asking him to one, reveal the degree to which your priority is really more your appetite than your God. And maybe even more, as we've already seen David pray, may God protect us from an inclination to the delicacies of the wicked or developing an appetite for the benefits that doing wrong can sometimes bring.